Welcome community. Today we are talking about cultivating a positive body image with God's help. According to a 2022 Good Housekeeping study, 87% of about over 4,000 respondents have been on a diet with the purpose, at least in part, to change their weight or shape. And only about 6% of respondents strongly agreed that they generally like feel happy with their bodies. And 17% said they'd be willing to shave a year or more off of their lives in exchange for their ideal body. That is just so unbelievable to me. Um, so, so many of us girls and women, we know that God created our bodies and called them good. His works are wonderful. We know that full well, but yet we have a really hard time genuinely believing that, you know, and so we are bombarded by all these images of the ideal body, diet culture, anti-aging, all these marketing campaigns. And it's so normal. It's so ingrained in us from the time we're little girls. And it can be hard to break through and to really renew our minds and have a different mindset about our bodies. And so, so many of us can find ourselves and I've been there too. And I have to renew my mind daily um, to change. You know, we've been conditioned to try to change our bodies. And so if you can identify with this today, today's conversation is for you. Our guest today is Heather Creekmore. I want to tell you a little bit about her. Heather writes and speaks hope to thousands of women each week, and she inspires them to stop comparing and to start living. And she is the host of the internationally popular Compare to Who podcast. She has been featured on Fox News, HuffPost, Morning Dose, um, church leaders and for every mom. And she's also been on other shows and podcasts. And this is really fun. Um, she was a contestant on Nailed It, which was the hit net Netflix bake fail show. And Heather and her Marine fighter pilot turned pastor husband, Eric, have four children and they live in Austin, Texas. Heather, welcome to Wonderfully Made. It's so good. Thank you for being a part of our community. Um, we're so glad you're here. I'm so glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Yes, of course. Um, so congratulations on the release of the 40 day body image workbook. If you're watching this via video, you can see Heather's cute book on my bookshelf. It goes with the little neutral boho theme here. Um, I had the opportunity to pre-read it, but now Heather, I am um, going back and really spending my time in it. And it's been really challenging for me and it's been really transformative for me. Um, and so I want to thank you for creating this resource for Christian women. Oh, thanks, Allie. I appreciate hearing that. Yeah. And so Heather, why don't we start by having you share your personal uh, journey with body image issues that have inspired you to support women in this way? Yeah. Well, you know, my story, the more I tell it, the more I hear feedback from people that say it was just like their story. And I know there's a little bit of overlap with our stories too, but I was probably in elementary school about the third grade when I first heard the thought or the whisper that my legs were too big. And I remember kind of going to school to check and see if that like whisper was true, comparing the size of my legs to the size of the legs of the other little girls in my class determining that my legs were too big and that I was going to have to do something to change that. Since my mom was a really good dieter, I had all the tools I needed <laughs> to get started right away. So by middle school, I was doing whatever diet mom did. And by high school, I had kind of decided that I was, um, I'm trying to think of the best way to phrase this, like maybe too good for diets, <laughs> that I could be better than those diets that only restricted calories or foods, that maybe I just didn't need to eat at all. And so I would go to school every day, you know, kind of make it through the whole school day and sometimes even after school activities without eating anything. And then I would get home and of course I would be ravenously hungry and, you know, just eat everything in sight, eat dinner regularly with my family and go to bed, Allie, really feeling like I had failed, like I had done something wrong. I had broken this promise to myself, like I was better than that. I really didn't have to eat. And, and that was a pattern for me for years. 
until I get to college, really. By the time I was a sophomore in college, I lost my period for about nine months. But at the time, there were only two categories for eating disorders. You either were anorexic or you were bulimic. And I tried to purge, but I couldn't. I mean, you know, like and really felt some shame around that too, because I thought that that would be my answer. And I didn't match the then criteria for anorexia, which was an underweight body. I was more of just a normal weight girl uh, who thought she needed to be smaller always. And so, you know, really after college, I discovered exercise which kind of changed my relationship with food a little bit, maybe for the better in some ways, because I realized I could eat more and I felt good eating more, but then I could go to the gym and I could exercise it off, which now I would categorize as some sort of exercise bulimia. But at the time, like I just thought I was being super healthy, right? Like I was just the picture of what a woman in America is who's healthy. She is burning it off and always worrying about what she's eating and how much she's exercising. And so it really wasn't until I was in my 30s um, and I had, you know, kind of tried everything in a way. You know, I, I actually became a fitness instructor thinking that would solve my body image issues. I, um, I got married at 31 and, and really there was a little part of me that thought all through my 20s that the reason I struggled with body image was because I was single, because no man had told me I was good enough to marry. And so got married and that didn't work. Um, even had kids and really thought and hoped that having children would kind of set me free from body image issues because I believed that it would take that mental energy I was giving to tracking food and exercise to raise those kids. And that didn't work either. I still had plenty of capacity to think about both. And it really wasn't until I was in my mid thirties that got kind of interrupted uh, life is normal for me. And I, I do need to kind of back up and say I was a Christian. Like I was raised in a Christian home. I went to Christian school starting in seventh grade. I went to Christian college. I went to a Christian graduate school. So I knew I was fearfully and wonderfully made. I knew from first Samuel that God looked at my heart. Like I knew all those things to be true, but I just had a really difficult time believing it, getting that knowledge from my head to my heart in a way that cured my body image issues. Thank you for sharing. Um, you know, I know my story is very similar to yours and I'm sure so similar to you friend who are listening. Maybe you can connect, um, with Heather's story. I know I remember the exact same thing. It was about my thighs, my athletic thighs. And that really, you know, started the, that journey as well. Um, and so Heather, uh, you have this quote in your book and you say, um, your your workbook or this journey is an invitation to try a new way, and it's to approach your body struggle issues as a matter of the heart and not of the body. I really really like that. And also, you say about it's it's more about our theology and our theological view of our body, which I think is really really interesting. Um, your book is especially, I think going to connect with people who, who really do have a deep understanding of scripture. I know you have a lot of references to the old Testament. Um, and so Heather, what are some of the most common lies women believe about their bodies and about their beauty and about their worth? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's so many Allie, but let me kind of back that up just a little bit, because I think the biggest lie that we believe is that fixing our body will fix everything. Mm. And that's kind of the overarching lie. It's the lie that we see on marketing. <laughs> you know, we see it in commercials. We see it on social media. Like the lie is just fix your body and then you'll be free. Right. And, and so beyond that, of course, you know, like we hear that we're not good enough. We're not thin enough. We're, you know, we're not the right shape where, you know, our face is wrong, like all the things. But in that, the belief that if we change our bodies, if we get the surgery, if we lose the weight, if we do the exercise to change the thing, if we get the hair, like we believe that that will fix it. And it doesn't. It just why doesn't. Do because... you think, why do you think we believe that? I mean, is it more of like a cultural thing? Is it media messages? Is it deeper than that? Yeah, it, it's all of that and deeper. And, and so it, this is really the key for me finding body image freedom was recognizing that I had made my body image an idol. Mm. And that idol, so idols can be good things, right? Like, you know, we can make 
marriage an idol. We can make children an idol. We can make our jobs an idol. We can make ministry an idol, right? So uh, idols can be good things, but when we put them in a place, an ultimate place, but I'm going to say a place where they offer us salvation, then that's when they've crossed the line to become idols, kind of substitutes for Jesus. And so for me, even though I could not have articulated it in this way to you, Allie, like there's no way I could have said it like this 15, 20 years ago. But now as I look back, I really believed that if I did what the marketers told me to do, if I could change my shape, if I could get the body, get the size, all the things, I believed that that would save me. And by save me, I don't mean like that I would go to heaven, but I mean that I would have peace and joy and rest and contentment and I would feel fulfilled. And wow, wasn't life just going to be wonderful as soon as I wore the size and got the look. And it was a kind of salvation that I craved. And, and I think as a Christian, I was almost more susceptible to it because I already had God in Jesus. It was like, check mark, check mark. I know the God in Jesus answer. I'm good for eternity. What I really need right here and now is to have this kind of body and then I will be saved. And really even to take it one step further, I'll be safe, right? No one will be able to criticize me. No one will ever reject me. Like I will have a look that will just carry me through <laughs> this hard world. And so it's tempting to believe it because that's what we long for, right? Like we want to be saved. We want to be safe. Like we'd be crazy not to. But the challenge becomes if we're looking to a body size or shape to save us or keep us safe, well, <laughs> it's not really an effective strategy, right? And Jesus is the only one who ultimately can save us and satisfy us and bring us that joy, peace, and rest that we crave. Hmm. I want to unpack this a little bit more, the idea sure. of our body or our, our ideal bodies becoming an idol in our lives. You know, I see that hindsight in my life too. Um, I, exactly what you um, explained was true for me as well. And I know it's true for so many girls and women. And we can think, you know, I just want to look better. You know, I just want to feel better. But we might not have that awareness of how much of an obsession or really this has become, you know, next to God or even striving, even thinking more, our thoughts um, may be filled with more about how am I going to change my body, um, you know, envisioning your perfect body, criticizing your body, more than our thoughts um, can go to God, our creator, who wonderfully, phenomenally created us. I, I think that is just so common. I've been there too. And there's no shame if you're listening and you're like, oh, wow, like this is helping me realize like this is really taking a lot of headspace. And I think, can you talk about like how this really prevents us from living into our true purpose? Yeah. Well, it becomes an obsession, like you said, and it's very subtle, right? I think mm -hmm. um, now, especially kind of the diet culture has moved to talking about health instead of thinness. And so when we were talking about thinness, it was like, well, of course, like that's vanity. But when it's about health, it doesn't sound like vanity anymore. Like it sounds like something that, you know, everyone should be striving for. So how could I be bad? How could I be, you know, following an idol if I'm just trying to be healthier? It's very insidious and very subtle. And mm -hmm. so what I like to teach women is the treasure principle, right? It's what Jesus taught in Matthew um, about how we think about money, right? Where your treasure is, your heart will be also. And so for me, it was just a matter of, of really being honest with myself. Like, what have I made my treasure? And if I looked at like where I spent my money, well, a lot of my money was spent on clothing and, you know, gym memberships and, you know, <laughs> nails and hair and other things, facials and other things to make sure that I always look my best, right? Um, and then what I spent my time on, right, money and time being kind of the two signals of, of where your treasure is, I spent my time on those things, right? I was more often going to a spin class than I was to the women's Bible study because what was really important to my life was the having the body that I thought going to spin class would give me. And so it is just, it's so tricky and so subtle. And there's not like this like stark line. It's kind of like the difference between 
it's, it's kind of like money, right? Like there's no like line that you cross and suddenly, you know, you're being greedy. <laughs> right? It's like, I'm just saving, I'm saving. Oh wait, now I'm being greedy. Like there's no alarm bell that comes and like tells you you've crossed that line. It's the same thing with body image, right? And yes, we care for our bodies, but there is this really subtle thin line that we can cross over into body image idolatry. If, if we're not, you know, really in tune with, okay, God, where's my treasure? Are you my treasure, Jesus? Or have I kind of subtly made health or body my treasure? I love that verse in Psalm 139 that says, search me, O God, and know me and test me and see if there is any offensive way in me and lead me into the way everlasting. Um, so friend, if you're listening and you're like, you know, I need to think about this some more, you know, maybe this is become somewhat of an idol in my life. Uh, maybe consider praying that prayer. God, search me, examine my heart, show me what my motives are and to really get quiet. And, you know, in his kindness, it's not a shame. God never shames us. Um, but he want, always wants something better for us. And I think that when we lay down our idols before God, he always gives us something better in return. Um, and I think, you know, we so often can cling to these things like, you know, I'm going to have this and we're afraid to let them go. But when we do, there's a better gift. Have you seen that true in your life, Heather, when you've kind of relinquished this obsession, what have you found instead? You know, the freedom is indescribable. It really is because like, I just don't have the static or the noise in my head like I used to. Now that's not to say that I don't have the occasional thought, you know, like, oh, you should try that plan. Oh, if you did that thing, you know, but I know what to do with it now. And so I know like how, how to handle, how to respond to those thoughts. But also I just feel so much freer, Allie, to pursue my purpose. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that in a cliche way. I, I mean that genuinely because I do believe that the things that God has allowed me to do, that he's called me to do, and that he's even given me the opportunity to do like the Netflix appearance, right? When I was really caught up in my body image issues, like that would not have been enjoyable because mm -hmm. I would have been so obsessed with making sure that I lost weight before I went on TV and making mm -hmm. sure that my nails were right. My hair was right. And like, what am I going to wear? Like that would have been months of obsession before that appearance. And, and even now, you know, I just think about how much freer I am to just go and speak what he's asked me to speak, I hope, <laughs> and, you know, write what he's asked me to write without being overly consumed as to like, how does my body look while I'm doing this? What is my body like? What are you thinking of my body? And, and I think I would have missed out on the opportunity to like, just do what makes me feel alive <laughs> because you're what, what's he, what he has created me for is what makes us feel alive. Right. And so I think I would feel like I would have missed out on those things that he's created me to do if I was still obsessing over my body. Mm -hmm. I'd like us to talk about the journey. Um, it's not like a three-step plan. We just don't do these three, three things and then like arrive at this marvelous place of freedom. It really is that journey. You know, we take a couple steps forward. We take a couple steps back. Um, and so Heather, I want to hear from you personally, what has your journey looked like? And, and also the women that you work with, what practical things or mindset shifts help, um, help people really get on that path to freedom from these struggles. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's, diff it's a little different for everyone, but I would say just like you mentioned for everyone, it is a journey, right? And for me, there were layers, right? Mm -hmm. Like God had really set me free from body image issues in an amazing way. And I wrote a book about it and published it in 2017. And now there's things in that book where I'm like, Oh, I, I want people to read that. <laughs> I don't necessarily believe that anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. Because there were other things that God had to work on that he hadn't like he hadn't touched my food yet. Like I was still very much a disordered eater mm -hmm. when I wrote my first book, but I had no idea that I was had, like no clue that that was even a thing. <laughs> right. Because, again, like I wasn't anorexic or bulimic, so I didn't have any food issues. I was just eating like everyone else in culture. So. It's a journey for everyone, I think, to kind of peel back layer by layer, like in some ways, like where did this come from? 
right? Like what's that first lie that I've believed? Where did that lie come from, right? Like obviously it came from the enemy, but you know, too often I hear like the comment that was made by the boyfriend in seventh grade that, Mm -hmm. you know, then I'm talking about talking to like a client who's in her fifties, who's still hanging, like not consciously hanging on, but still feeling like labeled by something that a boy whose last name she doesn't even remember (laughs) said, you know, 30 or 40 years Mm -hmm. ago. And that's the damage I think that, that a lot of us like go through life with, right? We accumulate, uh, these kind of, well, actually I had a woman who had someone drive by and say, lose some weight when she was in college. And she's now in her fifties, right? And it's like these drive-by shootings, if you will, of, of comments that the other person probably doesn't even remember making. Maybe they were said with intention, maybe not, but, but kind of unpacking, okay, where did this come from? And then what am I believing? Right? So Ali, like the culture we live in is really kind of confusing and messed up, right? (laughs) So we hear a lot, this concept of my truth. I think when it comes to body image issues, this is something we have to kind of check ourselves in the mirror around because I want to say my truth is Heather doesn't look good enough. My truth is Heather would be better if she, you know, lost some weight. Heather would be better if she like did this, right? And that's my truth about me and my value and my appearance, right? But God has truth, capital T truth, which should always trump my truth. And it's easy for us to see this in culture, right? And be like, no, 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 God's truth is best. But in our own lives, it's like, no, we actually have to surrender in a similar way and say, wait a second. No, I'm going to choose every day to believe what God says about me. What does God say about my value? What does God say about why my body was created? What does God say about my appearance? And I have to surrender all of my truth to his truth. And, and that's a process. I love the practical and we talk about this a lot on our podcast is taking these wonderful concepts, these wonderful principles. How do we apply these to our lives? How do we make them practical? Um, and I'd like us to talk a little bit more about that. Um, I have some things that I continue to practice that help me, but Heather, I want to hear for, for you, like, is there a specific verse that you repeat in your mind? Is there a specific truth declaration? You talk a lot about changing the way that we think, but how does that look like for you practically? Yeah. You know, for me, practically, it's really idol identification. <laughs> it's really what I do. And that's what I teach a lot of my clients to do, right? Like whenever there's something that I find myself fixated on, it's like, what do I believe that thing is going to give me? Like, Mm -hmm. why have I elevated it to that spot? Like, what am I believing? Or even like if I see a woman and I'm tempted to be like, oh, she looks so much better than I do. Oh, if I only looked like her, right? You know, the comparison thing, right? But then it's like, wait, what do I believe about like her body type or her body size or her life? Like, I'm objectifying her. Yes. And what am I also believing about her because of the way she looks? And and so I'm kind of constantly challenging that idol, the way it creeps up. You know, there's there's lots of practical ways. I think we can, you know, like you said, there's verses that encourage some people like more than others, right? Like, like my verse is Jonah 2, 8, those who pay attention to vain idols forsake all hope of steadfast love. And I know not many people have like a life verse from the book of Jonah, <laughs> but for me, it it really was you know, in my walk, my very long walk with the Lord, it was identifying that I had become an idolater that really turned everything around for me and and helped me find a new path. Thank you for sharing. Um, I'd love to share a few things that continue to help me. I'm still on this journey myself of renewing my mind. I mean, these thoughts have been like such an entrenched part of my journey as well. And it's, you know, daily asking God, just help me not to think this way or to believe that I still need to change my body. Um, one thing that I did is I wrote with a, a, um, a pen on my mirror, your body is good. Now go and love people. Mm -hmm. Um, that is really a reminder for me. I grew up constantly body checking. And I found that the more that I body check, the more hyper aware I am of my body, the more that I 
pick it apart. And how is my body looking today? If it looks good today, maybe I'm okay. If it doesn't look good, I'm not okay today. Um, also, I have a practice I've been trying to do when I do find myself tempted to compare. I say, she is wonderfully made and so am I. Her life is a miracle and so is mine. Also, I found um, wearing clothes that are more comfortable. I know you know this as well, and I'm sure you work with all these practical things with your coaching clients. Um, and what was one other thing? I think that's those are two of the big things for me. So I just wanted to share those with you who are listening in case you find that those may be helpful. Um, Heather, I just love this conversation. Um, listeners, I want to encourage you to grab a copy of Heather's wonderful book, The 40 Day Body Image Workbook. You can find that on Amazon, wherever books are found. Um, also, we'll share a link to Heather's website where you can connect with her. Her podcast is called Compared to Who? And so, Heather, if you had a megaphone right now and every girl and woman, um, in Western cultures who deal with body image, who deal with, you know, wanting to look a certain way, if everyone was listening to, to you, what would you want to say to them? Mm, that's such a good question, Allie. Whew. I would want to say that, first of all, do not believe the lie of the enemy who's telling you that you are different and you can't feel different. Because I think that's the number one thing that he tells people is that that works for other people, but that won't work for me. I'm never going to feel differently about my body. And so I would shout that, no, body image freedom is possible. You do not have to feel bad about your body for your whole life. Like that is not a sentence that you are um, sentenced to. <laughs> I should probably say that differently. But, but that's not something you're sentenced to. Like, Freedom mm -hmm. is possible. Freedom in Jesus, not freedom in a new body, but freedom in Christ is possible. And you can just, you will be amazed at how different you can and will feel when you find body image freedom. Hmm, that's so good. Thank you for sharing. Um, friends, I just want to point you to some of our resources. Um, we created a new online community for you. It's daily getting better. We have big vision for this. Um, it's our online community through Mighty Networks. You can find a link on our website and in the show notes. Um, it's just a beautiful place that we put Christ-centered encouragement and content. We're going to be offering um, resources with experts um, to encourage you in your faith and in your mental health. So we'd love for you to join there. Um, if anything we're doing here at Wonderfully Made, this podcast is an encouragement to you. Please share it. Please share with all the girls, with all the women in your life. We really are an intergenerational ministry. Um, and so we would love for you um, to just share this podcast, text it to a friend, um, subscribe um, wherever you listen. We are so grateful that you are part of our family, of, I guess, our sisterhood, our community here at Wonderfully Made. And I really hope that today's conversation really encouraged you. I know it did, Heather. I want to thank you for the work that you do to help so many girls and women find freedom. So thank you for joining us and um, we'll stay in touch with you. Sounds good. Thank you so much for having me.